Steve Morse is, at this point, practically a living legend. His influence on generations of guitarists looking to think out of the box, both figuratively and literally when it comes to pentatonic playing, is nearly incalculable. Steve really is the benchmark for a certain kind of originality on the instrument. His relentlessly inventive melodic sensibility seamlessly blends an array of rootsy American flavors with an almost impossible degree of mechanical capability. In fact, despite his renown among guitarists, Steve is perhaps most revered for his ability to play things that almost shouldn't be playable on a guitar at all. Some of his most interesting creations are keyboard-inspired or fiddle-inspired and bear almost no trace of the common cliches that we as guitarists often struggle to escape. What we're seeing here is one of the coolest magic tricks in all of rock guitar, and it's something that has rightfully garnered Steve a level of historical renown. One note per string, alternate picking. It's a feat that has captured the imagination of generations of players. And at the same time, it's so rare an ability that has been paradoxically easy to write off as a thing that only Steve does. Even the best players have been sort of exempted from knowing how to do this. It's almost like we've taken it off the table, otherwise nobody else would win, like the Black Lotus or goaltending in basketball. But like so many of the techniques we explore, what it really is, is an amazing mechanical engineering solution that actually becomes attainable for the rest of us once we know how it's put together. The technique is a showcase of the three components we've already identified. Steve's rotational motion mechanic, string tracking, and directional pick slanting. We've already seen pick slanting directionality in the scalar examples, but it's particularly evident here. We have the open finger shape for downward pick slanting, and then on the way back down, we have the closed shape, upward pick slanting. We've seen these already. They are the visual indicators of pick slanting in Steve's technique, and they appear all the time in his playing. We've also seen how this correlates to edge picking changes under the camera, where the ascending side uses leading edge, and the descending side uses a flatter or zero degree edge. But what's the point? Why do this? Well, let's think about this logically. Let's say we're playing one note on a string, ascending, and obviously we're using alternate picking. If we choose downward pick slanting like Steve does, then right away we know that all the upstroke string changes will be efficient. This is because in three out of six cases, the upstroke will rise out of the plane of the strings and not hit any of the other strings. This is all thanks to downward pick slanting. And if we look at the close-up camera, this is exactly what we see. The upstrokes lift immediately out of the strings with no chance of hitting anything. So by simply choosing a pick slant, we've instantly solved 50% of the string changes. And as an engineering solution, that is a damn good starting point. But what about the other string changes? Those are all downstrokes. In fact, in the traditional downward pick slanting scenario, we would have no way of getting over those strings at all. The picking motion is happening along this plane here. So the upstrokes are all up here, and the downstrokes are all down here, where they're stuck. The best we can usually do is simply avoid these downstrokes altogether and design licks that only ever switch strings using upstrokes. This is exactly what Ingve and Eric Johnson do, and this is the classic downward pick slanting way. But as an experiment, what would happen if we did try to switch strings after those downstrokes? Well, this might happen. This is the Paul Gilbert lick played intentionally with only downward pick slanting. You can see clearly that the pick is hitting the next higher string instead of getting over it. And we know from anti-gravity that this is what we call swiping. 
Now, in this case, it makes sense. In the downward pick slanting world, technically you can't switch strings after a downstroke because, again, the pick is stuck between the strings. So one possible solution to this problem is to not even bother getting over the string at all. Just play right on through it. The reason this works is that the upper string, the swipe string, is muted by the fretting fingers. In addition, the note right before it on the lower string is still ringing, and this sound tends to mask the noise that occurs when the pick swipes the upper string. What's amazing is that this is often completely inaudible. And this is actually one of the big reasons why players say they sometimes prefer outside string changes like this one. It's because outside string changes are swipeable. In fact, this process is so automatic that most players who use swiping don't even realize they're doing it. They may think they're getting over the string when in fact they're just passing through. Now inside string changes on the other hand are exactly the opposite. This is the inside version of the same Paul Gilbert lick. In an inside string change, the difference is that the string we have to get over is no longer the next string, it is the same string we just played. In this case, after we play the last note on the lower string, we then have to get over the top of that same string before we can get to the next one. And if you try to swipe this kind of string change, you're going to double strike the note that's already ringing. And because it's not muted, you're going to hear it. And on top of this, you'll also feel it. You're so close to that string that you haven't really built up enough momentum yet to power through it. And it feels very obvious when you make contact, almost like tripping over a hurdle. The net result of all this is that swiping on inside string changes really sounds and feels like a mistake. This is why so many players notice inside string changes and think of them as problematic. And Steve himself actually says this in the interview. Here's the... the the problem of, of alternate picking is when you're headed toward a string that's down mm -hmm. and your pick is ending on a string that's with a stroke that's up. And so so sometimes I would practice the, the down on like on the G string and up on the D. Now this is important because what Steve is telling us is that inside string changes require special consideration. They cannot be swiped, so we actually have to solve them. And what is the solution? Of course, it is pick slanting. By simply slanting the pick downward, the pick lifts right over the top of the string. The note is not double struck, and the tripping feeling is completely gone. Now, here's the kicker. Let's go back to that one note per string example. Take another look at those upstroke string changes, the ones we've solved through pick slanting, and you will notice something amazing. They are all inside string changes. So it's not just that pick slanting solves half the string changes, it's that it solves precisely the most problematic half of them that cannot be swiped. And this only happens because we chose downward pick slanting. In other words, this only happened because we chose a pick slant that was directional. So the rule that we're learning here and that Steve has ingeniously figured out for us is that in order for inside string changes to be efficient, they must always be directional, where the pick slants in the direction of the string change. So if inside string changes control the directionality in Steve's playing, then what would happen if we asked him to play a lick that was only inside string changes? <laughs> Of course, two-way pick slanting, the purest expression of directionality that exists. Every string change is an inside string change. Every pick slant is directional. This is like the wormhole between Steve's world and ours. Amazing. But now we have a problem. Directionality is great for inside string changes, but it is bad for outside string changes because those are all still stuck down here. How do we solve the downstrokes? Well, it's motion mechanic to the rescue. We've been imagining that the path of the pick is straight, and that's why it starts up here and ends all the way down here. But we've also seen that the picking motion can often be rotational. We've seen this in Eddie's playing. We've also seen it in my own playing. So that means that this line isn't actually straight, it's sometimes slightly curved. But when we play Ingve licks and Eric Johnson licks, 
It's a moot point because we don't make use of that curvature. Instead, we only ever switch strings when the pick is up here. So for all practical purposes, in a pure pick slanting scenario, this may as well be a straight line because it just doesn't matter either way. But when we look at Steve's technique, it is clear that this curvature does matter. The graceful arc of the pick stroke is more than evident here. This is highly unique and very beautiful. What's incredible is how shallow it is. It is rotational, but to such a flattened out degree that from the wide camera angle, it's pretty much invisible. And this explains the seeming disappearance of the twisting motion in Steve's earlier demonstration. This way. Now you see it. Now you don't. The swing is so shallow that it is very far from the jumping motion of string hopping that we see, for example, in Eric Johnson's bounce technique. In a way, Steve's rotation is the anti-string hop. It is a curved motion that approaches the efficiency of a linear one by virtue of being so flat. And just how flat is that? Well, imagine you've got a row of lawn flamingos. And let's say our goal is to swing a golf club and hit only one of them while not hitting any of the others. If we swing too low, we'll knock them off. And if we swing too high, we'll miss entirely. So obviously the club head needs to dip below the flamingo height so that we can make contact. But it also has to rise up above the flamingo height to avoid hitting the next one. So what we need to figure out here is what is the flattest possible arc we can trace that will actually accomplish this because the flattest arc will also be the fastest one. And of course that flatness is determined by how much space we have to work with between the two bounding flamingos and also by how low we choose to go. So the club depth is our variable. And now we need to do some math. Multiply by two, carry the one, speed of sound at sea level, Kepler's second law, account for frictional losses. And there, done. So what we're seeing here is this. If we use a lot of club depth, or in reality, a lot of pick on the string, then the maximum radius of the circle we can draw becomes limited by the distance between the strings, which is about three eighths of an inch. As we use less and less depth, then that circle radius gets bigger and bigger as it approaches infinity or basically flat. To plug in a realistic number, let's say between 1 8 and 1 16 of an inch of pick depth, we get anywhere from one to about two inches. The entire spread of the strings is also about two inches, so that actually sounds about right. For example, here's Steve playing a note on the D string. The pick stroke begins way up here above the E string, then we swing down and hit the note, and then we wind up all the way down here above the B string. That's a four string spread. Two strings on either side are about an inch and a half in total. Now on the surface, this may seem excessive, but consider that if we used a smaller movement, then we'd need a tighter radius to get over the string. And that's precisely the problem with string hopping. String hopping is more of a V shape rather than an arc. And that's why it's strenuous and exhausting to do it fast. But in Steve's case, the resulting arc is so flat and so smooth that you really can't see it at all in the wide shot. I guess, yeah. And learning to do Steve's technique, first and foremost, is learning to do the wide and flat rotation. Steve already showed us the movement, and it's this. This way, I'm rotating two different axes. Now, as you experiment with this, you also probably want to be doing it across the strings, since that's how you're going to be using it in actual practice. And that means you'll need to involve string tracking. If you hard anchor, then you'll be using a clock face style string tracking, which is this sweeping motion of the wrist. If you loosely anchor, then you can use the sawing style of string tracking, which is an elbow shoulder movement. And you may even discover that you're doing a blend of both. This compound version is very natural and pretty common, so you may not have to think about it too much other than to understand that string tracking is one of the three ingredients of Steve's technique that you may have to adjust to make it work. The third ingredient is, of course, pick slanting. The tendency to slant the pick in the direction of the string changes is actually pretty natural, and of course we see it all the time in sweeping. The naturalness of this tendency is probably one of the reasons why Steve hit upon it in the first place. And because of this, it is also something that you may not have to think about too much, at least at first. The idea here is really to get all three of these ingredients into your mixing bowl and begin to blend them together. And as you do that, realize that there is not one single recipe for that blend. In fact, it turns out that these three ingredients, rotation, string tracking, and directionality, 
are the universal ingredients of one note per string alternate picking. And once you know what to look for, you'll see them all the time. The rotation in Rusty's approach is very obvious here. He's using a tighter radius with more obvious forearm twisting and more pronounced directionality. It takes more athletic power to do this. And of course, Rusty has that in spades. Figuring out how these different blends work is not practice in the traditional sense. This is not about setting a metronome and working up slowly a few BPM each day. You can't practice what you don't even know how to do. Instead, this is more like learning to ride a bike or do the moonwalk. You have to figure out how the movement itself works. And you do this by a process of controlled, random experimentation until you find the blend where all three movements begin to synchronize and the whole system starts to feel smooth. For me, that blend happened when I was sitting at the kitchen table one day and I just started doing it. And thanks to the magnet, here is some actual practice footage from that day in question. The movement here is effortless. You can see it's almost dead flat, pretty close to the theoretical limit of flat curvature we worked out earlier. That's where the speed is coming from. In fact, the click that you hear is 209 beats per minute. This is the tempo of too many notes. It's sort of the Mach 1 of one note per string alternate picking. Too many tempo is a litmus test of the technique because it is beyond the speed that string hopping can reach for most people. In fact, here's some string hopping practice footage. This is the four string pattern from Too Many Notes, just to see how fast I could brute force it. The tempo here is not Mach 1. It's actually 10 BPM slower than that because that's as fast as I could get it to go. And it's obvious right away that this movement is much more vertical. And because of this, it's much more physically exhausting to do it. In fact, I could only finish a couple of repetitions of the pattern before the click started to run away from me. Now, here's the same four string pattern, but using Steve's approach. The difference is obvious. The motion is a much more graceful rotation, which takes far less effort to do. The click here actually is Mach 1, and reaching it is really no problem at all. There's the open shape. There's the closed shape. These are your keys to understanding the sequence of movements involved. And there is a sequence. It's amazing how specific this all is. This is not just randomly playing notes any old which way and then trying to get faster using a metronome. It is far from that. But as you work on finding the blend, probably the best way to do that is at a moderate tempo. The idea here is that the kind of super precise robot movements that we tend to make at very slow tempos are simply not realistic. They're not representative of what it feels like to play fast. And super fast speeds are asking you to do something that you haven't yet figured out how to do. But a moderate tempo allows you to think in the kind of smooth, natural curves that we see in most guitar playing movements, while still being slow enough that you can actually do it. Once you get the basic blend happening, one thing to watch out for as you get faster is fine-tuning it. At these incredible speeds, Steve is tracing the flattest possible arc that he can. So the tolerances are all really fine and the margin for error is tiny. If you use too much directional pick slanting, or if you don't track the rotation exactly precisely, the whole thing is just amazing. The incredible way this is all put together, it's almost like looking at the framework on the inside of the Statue of Liberty. What was also amazing was meeting Steve. It 
It really was a privilege to experience the engineering marvel of his abilities in such an unguarded fashion. <laughs> Having done lots of this kind of filming and knowing just how hard it is to play well when the cameras are rolling, let alone when they're strapped directly to your guitar, Steve wins many points in my book for being so forthcoming. And seeing the genius of his approach in action up close like this, it is truly a beautiful thing to watch.